This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in it and bless your name. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in it and bless your name. We woke up by your grace and mercy. You have renewed them for today. Your love endures for you are good. Now let all your people say, this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice. We will rejoice and be glad in it and bless your name. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice. We will rejoice and be glad in it and bless your name. You are our God, be exalted. You are worthy to be praised. If this will be our final breath, let it glorify your name. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice. There's so many things to be thankful for Thanksgiving. We uh, celebrated our first whole year the week before Thanksgiving with our son being back. Amen. And he's back there. I don't want to embarrass him. <laughs> Y'all, most of you in this congregation know the story. And I want to thank you once again for your prayers for, for him and our family during that time. So this is second Thanksgiving, but it's just very special just encourage you um, I hope you did 
I'm kind of joking about this. Not joking, but there's a bug that's going around, and uh, mm -hmm. apparently, if you hug each other, you most you might catch it. <laughs> <laughs> but um, we, we made a point to hug each other every day in our house, and especially that young man that came back, mm -hmm. my son Rod. Oh, we, we hug every day because you never know. Just keep hugging your brothers and sisters in Christ. You never know. I'm looking for that great reunion <coughs> someday.
Understand, but if you feel led to stand at any point in song, go ahead. Especially when you get to the bridge part, you might hear an interesting sound <laughs> up here. There might be a vanishing happening. These are the days of Elijah, declaring the word of the Lord. And these are the days of your servant Moses, righteousness being restored. And these are the days of great trials, amen, of famine and darkness and sorrow. Still we are the voice in the desert, crying, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Behold, he comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun at the trumpet call. So lift your voice, it's a year or two believe, out of science hill, salvation comes. These are the days of Ezekiel, the dry bones becoming as flesh. And these are the days of your servant David rebuilding a temple of praise. And these are the days of the harvest, the fields are as white in the and we are the laborers in your vineyard, declaring the word of the Lord. Behold, he comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun at the trumpet call. So lift your voice, it's the year of Jubilee, out of Zion's hill, salvation comes. Behold, he comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun. At the trumpet we call, so lift your voice. It's the year of Jubilee, out of science hill, salvation comes. There's no God like Jehovah. 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 Behold, he comes riding on the clouds, shining like the sun at the trumpet call. So leave your voice. It's a year or two to out of science hill, salvation comes. Behold, he comes, riding on the clouds.
clouds shining like the sun at the trumpet call. So lift your voice, it's the year of Jubilee. Out of Zion still salvation comes. One more time, Paul. Our scripture reading is from Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 through 12. For this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of the God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power, for all patience and long suffering, with joy giving thanks to the Father, who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. morning. Welcome everyone today. So glad you've joined us. If you had trouble following the the words on the songs, that that was my fault. Norman went home not feeling well this morning. Debbie's still recovering from the sickness and we do have the Miley's family back. Glad you guys are on the upswing. So glad to have you back with us. It just seems like something's in the air and uh, we just take it as it comes, but God is still on the throne. Amen. We would like to welcome you this morning. We're going to continue our study in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And our title this week is The Gifts of the Spirit Part 2. Father, we ask that you speak to us this morning. We do have some sensitive things in this message this morning. But at the same time, Lord, I believe it's of you that brings clarity in the culture that we live in and the church, the role of the church, the purpose of the church. And the fact that we have to keep the culture out of the church. We should be a light to the culture, not let the culture dictate the church. So we pray this morning, Lord, that you just give us wisdom, discernment, understanding, and guidance as we go through this message today. Speak to our hearts. We thank you when we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, last week we looked at the gifts of the Spirit. We looked at who gives them why they're given, and we know that that is to edify the body of Christ. That is the purpose of the gifts of the Spirit. It's never to be my gift. It's never to be what I have received, what I can do. It's about being a willing vessel or a conduit. We talked about last week to allow the Holy Spirit to flow through us, to give the gifts as he sees fit to edify the body. And they're also there to accomplish what the Spirit sends them to do. The gifts of the Spirit are given for a purpose the Spirit has in mind. He's not going to give the gift if it's not going to do what it's supposed to do. The gifts aren't out there just to have. They're out there for a purpose. And it is to edify the body. And whatever the plan the Holy Spirit has, He's going to do. And we read in Isaiah 55, verse 11, So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void. But it shall accomplish what I please. And it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. And it's the same with the gifts of the Spirit. They're given to accomplish the purpose of what the Spirit has sent to do. And it's going to happen. We just need to be out of the way of it and be willing partners with it. There's a, and you say, well, how can we do both? <laughs> well, you can be a willing vessel 
open your heart to receive all the Lord has for you to edify the body through you, to, to flow through you, and not then try to dictate what that looks like. It means that we're not in control of it. We are receptors, and then we send it out and let the Spirit do what He wants to do. All comes from God, and all is given for His purpose, according to His plan to edify the church and to be a light unto the world. See, it's twofold. The body is to be edified with the gifts, but also the gifts are meant to, be, to enhance our light. See, here's the thing. If the church, the body of Christ, is the light of the world, Jesus first said he was the light. He's the light of the world. Well, now he is in us, which means we are now the light of the world. And he said that as well. You're the light of the world. Now, the light is to shine forth first within the body of Christ. It shines brightly that we are glorifying God. We're worshiping God. We're in him. We're edifying one another. And what's the purpose of that? To strengthen us to go out to be the light to the world. If you come to church or you come to a gathering and you leave the same that you came, you really haven't understood the fact that you're supposed to gain when you come. But it's not just about coming to gain, it's coming to give. That's really where I think the church has missed it so many times. I, I've heard thousands of times over the years, well, I'm just not getting anything out of it. I'm just, you know, there's, I'm not being fed. Well, there are some places where the word's not feeding. So, you know, there's a problem there. But if you're going to a church and you don't like the music or you don't like the way this is being done or you think it could be done better or my last church did it this way, and that's a real common phrase. Well, we used to do it this way at my old church. We used to, well, why'd you leave? If it was so good, why did you leave? But the purpose of all of this is that we come together in unity in the Spirit so that then we're able to be the light when we go out of here. This building is not anything but a building. You are the church. You are the light of the world. You need to be prepared to allow the Holy Spirit to work through you. Now, unfortunately, in these finite minds, sometimes we bring unbalance to the things of God when we try to control them or manipulate them or even use them outside of the Spirit's leading. The gifts can be manipulated for personal gain, and I believe that's robbery of God. It's not supposed to be what we can do with the gifts. It's supposed to be what He wants to do through us. It's a very dangerous thing when we try to manipulate the things of God. What it does, it, it brings a misrepresentation of the gifts and the Holy Spirit himself. Many people don't like to talk about the Holy Spirit. There are some uh, denominations that don't really focus on the Holy Spirit at all. They don't bring him up. He's living inside them, but yet they don't bring him up. They don't want to talk about him. Why? Because they don't understand him. They have been taught or seen things out of balance. They have been uh, in fear in some cases of the Holy Spirit. Well, if that's the Holy Spirit, I don't want any part of that. Well, I've been in churches where I'd agree with them. But at the same time, we can't push aside the third person of the Trinity, the Spirit himself who dwells in us. We cannot deny him. And we cannot deny the gifts. We cannot deny them to do that. And say, well, that's really not real. But God is real. And His Spirit is real. And He wants to move in us. The shepherds of the church need to be careful that they only stay within the guidelines that were given. And not get off in chaos land. Nor on the other extreme of denying the gifts for today. And this balance only comes from the Spirit Himself. That's the only place balance comes from God. We'll mess it up every time. We're out of balance. We're out of balance because we're born with a sinful nature. It wasn't God's intent that we be born with a sinful nature. It was his intent that we be in the garden forever with Adam and Eve. But because of the fall, sin came into the world. And when sin entered the world, it tainted us all. And now we're all out of balance, so we have to submit to him. We have to die to that imbalance to be able to walk in the balance of God. We need to be in His presence. We need to be seeking Him. And to move as He wills. 
and then being obedient to follow him. Not to act and then ask. And there's a big issue sometimes in the church today or even the hearts of people. I've heard it said, well, I'm just going to do this and hopefully God will come along. And hopefully God's in this. I'm just going to go forth and do it. Listen, don't ever take a step ahead of God. That's a bad place to be. It's a dangerous place to be because you're supposed to be representing God. You're, you're an ambassador of Christ. And if you're outside of his will because you feel an urgency to do something and it's not him telling you to do it, it's going to mess it all up and it's going to leave a stain. People are going to see it. He's going to say, well, I thought he was a Christian. I thought he was doing what God wanted him to do. Well, that's sure he fell flat on his face, didn't he? So we don't need to be out of balance. We don't need to be ahead of God, but we need to be walking with him. We need to say, Lord, I want to move as you see fit in my life. So here I am. Use me as you will and use me as you want. Now this week, we're going to see how the gifts should work in the body in unity with each other. If one or more gifts dominate or rule over the others, it's always going to bring unbalance. And we've seen in the Pentecostal movement particularly, tongues and prophecy have dominated every other gift. Healing's up there pretty high, but tongues and prophecy, tongues and prophecy, to the point to where if you don't speak in tongues, I'm not sure you're filled in the Spirit. And the extreme of that, if you haven't received the gift of tongues, you may not even be saved. That is blasphemy. I'm sorry, but that's just not, not biblical at all. has nothing to do with whether you're a believer or not. We need to be submitted to what he wants to do in our lives and not take one gift and elevate it over the others. So let's pick up. Again, we're going to go back to verse 11. We read that last week. We're going to start in verse 11 in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and then go forward. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that same body, being many, are one body. So also is Christ. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into the body. Whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit. Now, when you read that, it, it can almost be a little confusing. Wait a minute, we're, we're many, but we're one, and so is Christ, and He's one, but He's in us, and we've all one Spirit. It's the oneness is what, is what we're really looking at here. We come individually. Each one of us comes individually to meet Jesus. The Holy Spirit touches our hearts. We respond we recognize that we're sinners. We recognize that we need a Redeemer. We recognize that we have to have Jesus in our hearts and our lives in order to be reconciled back to the Father. All of this is true, and it's all an individual thing. But then we come together, and the individualism has to be somewhat put down so that we can be corporate. Because what we're doing now is we're saying, okay, my individualism doesn't matter when it comes to what I want or don't want. It matters that I'm here to serve God and to love one another. Two greatest commandments. They continue to come up, don't they? It's where we are. But I want to stop after these two verses for a moment because there's a particular issue that we need to address in the church. It's a cultural issue and it's a cultural divide in the world. And it's a culture divide in the church today. And for years, I have seen the racial and cultural divide that keeps us not only, uh, not only this cultural divide in the world, but it's also brought into the church in its bondage. Now, these last verse, verse 13, For one spirit we're all baptized into the body, whether Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. As I mentioned in the last few messages, you cannot fix spiritual problems through fleshly means. You can't address cultural battles and cultural issues in the flesh. You're just going to mess them up. I want to share with you a couple of statements that I've heard. Two different churches, two different pastors over the years that God was preparing 
me and preparing us to come and be where we are today. He placed us in different positions, different, different situations, under different pastors. And sometimes he put us in places we didn't want to be. Talk about not liking or not wanting. And God said, tough, sit it out. Didn't use those words, but that was pretty much what he was saying. I know that you've been wounded in this place. I know that some things have happened here, but I'm not done with you yet here. You have things to learn. And the biggest thing was humility. To say, yes, Lord, when you did not even want to get out of bed to go to that church that morning. But God said, go. God said, no, I'm not done. You, you keep going. But in this one church, the pastor wrote a book on racial reconciliation. And he made the statement that we, as white believers, need to go and build relationships with those of color and first apologize for their pain that our ancestors caused and then offer some type of retribution from the past. Now, this is a fairly large church, and they had several services. They had Friday night service, several Saturday services, and a couple of Sunday services. Again, very large church. Now, in his plan, the pastor's plan to build rec uh, racial reconciliation and unify the church, he, w he had different pastors that he would assign to each service. It would, it would be, they would call them the pastors. Basically, he was the senior pastor. He did the teaching, but he had them kind of meet and coordinate uh, over each particular service. And in the spirit of diversity, he appointed some of color and some of different descents to oversee these services. What actually happened was those of color started going to the service that were led by those of color. And those of other descents, the same thing, they followed suit. So by trying to bring unity, by focusing on diversity, what he was trying to accomplish, accomplished just the opposite. It didn't happen. He had different services that were now culturally driven. Completely opposite of what he was trying to do. But this was what happened. Why? Because he, in his mind, thought we could make these decisions and make these things happen and we can fix a problem that only Jesus can fix. Also, in this same church, they had several worship teams for the different services and they would rotate. And I know personally of one that approached and they wanted to see if they could be on the worship team and they were told no because they needed more cultural diversity to be represented in worship. Actually, what they were told is no you're too white. That's really what was said. Now, I know this is a, one of these topics. Where, why are we talking about this? Why are you bringing this to church? Because it's in the world, and because it's in the world, it's been brought into the church, and rather than taking these social issues and bringing them to the cross individually, corporately now feels it has to fix a problem that it can't fix. Now, the second example I was in a different church, and at the end of the service, the pastor asked for everyone to look around the room, and these were his words. He said, the church is too white. We need to go the next week and invite someone of color to come with us to church. He then told everyone who was committed to do so to stand up and to affirm their commitment that morning. Unfortunately, this church is no longer around. They've disbanded, and the first church that I spoke of has had so many people left wounded over this issue and others over the years. So why do I bring this up? For this very reason, we as the body of Christ should never be caught up in trying to solve cultural problems using plans and schemes of the world through man's eyes. It cannot be done. And again, I'm going to reread this verse 13. For by one spirit, we're all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. Now, Colossians 3.10 uh, through 11 puts it this way. It says, and have put on the new man, meaning that the old man is no longer alive. We have died to the old man. We've now put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, 
barbarian, Scythian, slave, or free. But Christ is all and in all. So what is this telling us this morning? We are new creations in Christ. Our old man is no longer dominant and in control. That means whoever, wherever, whatever we came from is no longer to be the issue. We are one in Christ now. And it doesn't matter where we come from. His ways, his thoughts, his identity of how he sees himself and how he sees others, it's all changed by the Spirit of God. In the body of Christ, there's no longer Jews or Greeks. And when it mentions Greeks here, it's including every ethnic group in the cultures. Everyone. We're no longer Jews or Greeks. We're now one in Christ. We're not identified by race or color or wealth or education or prominence or anything else that we can look at and hang on our wall and say, look, this is who I am. That's not who we are. We're now a child of God. And the other things are to be put aside. We're one with Christ. One in His Spirit. And now we're one with each other. And Paul understood this when he wrote in Philippians chapter 3, verses 3 through 8. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit. Now, what he was addressing, this is um, what he's talking about in circumcision here. He's talking about we're circumcised by the heart, not in the flesh. And so when he's talking about this, he said, We in the Spirit are circumcision who worship God in the Spirit. Rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh, meaning that none of the things that, that I, we are identified in the flesh matter anymore. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Now this is Paul putting himself out there. And he's telling us if he wanted to be in pride and walking in pride, he's got reason to. He can back it up. Verse 5, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But hear what he said here in verse 7. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted lost for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ. Paul is saying here that his past identity, of which he walked in pride, he was very prideful of being a Jew, being of the tribe of Benjamin, his education was second to none, trained by the highest educators. His position, he was a Pharisee, a lawyer. He had it. He had it all together. His heritage, again, was from the tribe of Benjamin. And he was zealous for God through the law, meaning his religiosity. He was very zealous for his religion. He didn't know God, but he thought he was doing it for God. All of this was part of his zealousness. And the persecution of the church followed that. Jesus changed his identity from a prideful man to a child of God. He changed it. Paul was so clear on this point that the word he used for rubbish here in verse 8 in Philippians is the Greek word Scubalon, it means refuse or dung. That's what it means. That's how he viewed the old man. But wait a minute. He had it all. He was in line to be the next high priest. He was, he was, he was set up for life. He counted it as rubbish. He counted it. Is dung. He said, it, it doesn't matter. I don't even want to look at that as value anymore. My value is now in Jesus. Now, this may seem foreign to some this morning, but according to what we're reading today, 
we as believers, being new creations, should look at the old man, which includes the pride of our heritage, our old identity. We need to look at it the same way that Paul did. That's the old man. That's no longer valuable to me. What possible value, when you think about it in these terms, before Jesus, everything was about me and everything was about what I can gain today. And we can gain it all. Gain the world. Gain everything you want to have. But it's all going to rot. It's all going to rust. It's all going to turn to nothing. And when you meet Jesus face to face, everything you had, I promise you, if we don't give it up now, we're going to look at it then and say, oh, no. Because now we're eternity. We're going to have an eternity separated from God. If we today were to do this, the church would no longer be divided over cultural issues. There would be no cultural battles within the body of Christ. They are today. I know there are preachers in this town who are not preaching Jesus. They're preaching dissension, anger, and hate. It's all about the old man and what the old man deserves. And how he needs to be, uh, you know, it needs to be fixed. And we can only do it by doing these things. And they come up with all of these ways to be able to do it. And they write book after book after book. And it accomplishes nothing. All it's doing is keeping people in bondage. Thinking that if we change the mind of men, we can change the situations. You cannot change the minds of people because they're very easily turned back. You cannot convince somebody to know Jesus. Altar calls are great. But if you come down out of an emotional altar call because the music was right and you felt something move and you come down, that within itself can change your mind. But if you can talk, be talked into something, you can surely be talked out of it. None of these things will make a lasting impression. The only thing that will bring healing in our culture is Jesus. And if it's not happening in the church then we're messing up. Jesus is the answer here. We need to be united in the Spirit. We need to be true brothers and sisters in the Lord, serving one another in love with no division among us. And again, this can only be accomplished in a relationship with Jesus Christ and in the power of the Holy Spirit. It can't be done through man trying to appease or fix a problem that's rooted in sin. It's rooted in sin. It's rooted in the flesh. That's where all of the past came, uh, comes from. Until we recognize it within ourselves first. And deal with that between us and God. Then it's not going to be corporately effective. And then we're not going to be the light that we're supposed to. To shine into the culture to say, listen, I know that these are real issues. I know there's real suffering. I know there's real pain. I know there's real abuse. I know this is happening in the culture. But we can't go into the culture and try to fix it through the culture. We need to bring Jesus to the culture. And he's in you. He's in us. And this is what we're called to do. The truth is we can't fix ourselves without Jesus, let alone worldly problems. And then allowing those worldly problems to come into the church, bringing division among God's people. It shouldn't be done. The answer to every cultural problem is Jesus. But if we're not allowing Jesus to change the hearts and minds of the people in the body of Christ, and if we're still hanging on to past, to past hurt, to past abuse, to past sin, to past fear. If we're still hanging on to that as the body of Christ, then we got work to do. 
We need to get on our knees individually and say, Lord, forgive me for hanging on to something that is no longer a value to me. It should not be a value to me. I want to lay that down. And if I lay that down, I want you then to fill me up with the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ, with the fullness of the power of the Holy Spirit, so that the gifts of the Spirit that we're talking about this morning flow through us to address these things in love, but truth. And not be bound up in the bondage of the world. Let's preach the gospel to the world first in, in word and then by example. Many say, well, I, live my, I, don't, I, I don't feel comfortable sharing, sharing in word. I, I just want them to see the light in me. Are they really seeing the light? They go together. Because... What comes out of your heart, your mouth speaks. So if you're not saying anything at all, what's in your heart? Is it empty? Is it afraid? But we have to use words. That's how we communicate. We communicate in words. Now, today's culture, they, the words, they don't seem to mean as much as they used to, do they? They want to reinvent them, want to re-identify and redefine them on what they mean. But words are words. They mean what they mean. Truth is truth. It means what it means. And if it's in us, then we need to be presenting the word in love and then living it out in love so that they're seeing the full picture. You know, it's, it's just like the prosperity teachers. They only give you, they only give you part of, of, of the message. You're blessed. Yes, we are. God loves you. Yes, he does. He's going to deliver you. Yes, he will. But what, if, what is our part? Repent. Repent. Come into the relationship with Jesus. Don't just come thinking you deserve something because we deserve nothing. But Jesus came. While we were still sinners, he came and he gave himself for us. So we need to hang on to that and let that shine through us. We need to love each other in the fullness of the Spirit of God, submitting to the Spirit so that we're able to walk in the giftings we're given, which leads us into the rest of our study. Amen. Verses 14 through 27. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I'm not of the body. Now, let me stop for just one second on that, because this is, a, this is an issue sometimes in the church. People aren't really comfortable with what they're really called to do. They would rather have somebody else's gift. I'd rather be the eye than the hand. The hand gets dirty. Yeah, but the eye sees stuff it ought not to see. Every part of the body functions a very specific way and every part of the body because of the sinful nature of man is still tainted to some degree so we have to continually to die daily so no matter what part you are you're operating according to what you're called to do and not sitting there desiring to be somebody else or something else walk in what god's given you and if an ear should say because we're not an eye and i'm not of the body's here no for no part of the body if the whole body were an eye where would be the hearing if the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? But a God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. And if there were all one member, where would the body be? But now indeed there are many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I had no need of you. Nor again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. See, this is the wonderful thing about the body of Christ is we do need one another. But we need one another to be walking in the unity of Christ before they try to walk in unity with each other. Because if you're not, you're really not in unity with each other. Got to be in unity with Jesus first. No, much rather those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable... On those we bestow great honor, and our unpresentable parts have great or greater modesty, but our pre presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body, 
having given great honor to that part which lacks it, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer. They suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now, you're the body of Christ and members individually. Again, the individualism is there, but we're all part of the body of Christ. And we have to come together moving as one, not as us trying to drive it in our individualism. So what we see in these verses is God gives the diversity of the gifts. And these gifts work together to accomplish all of the work the Spirit is, 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 is working to do. And it's done in a unified and a balanced way. When it's done in order, when it's done properly, when it's done in submission, when we're walking in Jesus individually and then we come together corporately, it's going to be balanced. If you have division... If you have problems with the body and the body's not getting along with each other and it's out of balance, then one or more <laughs> is not walking in the spirit. They're walking in the flesh, which we're told not to do. And when you walk in the spirit, there's no room for division or schism that we read in verse 25. Schism is division. It's a, it's a dissension. Just an underline, sometimes it may not be elevated to the point where it's talked about, but it's there and people can sense it and they can feel it's like, eh, this didn't right. But all the giftings are equally important to the body, not just the ones that are most visible or the most recognized. Greater honor is given to those who walk in obedience to their gift, though their gift may seem less important. Listen, everyone is important in the body of Christ. And some may say, well, I don't feel like I have anything to offer. Do you love Jesus? If the answer is yes, then you have plenty to offer. Why? Because he's going to put it in you. And it's going to flow through you. And it's going to be used according to his will. So it's really not a matter of what you have to offer. It really comes down to what are you willing to allow God to do through you. And it may be that you're called to be a prayer warrior more than you are to be a public speaker or to go out on the street and witness. You may be a prayer warrior that is really willing to put on that armor of God and go into your prayer closet into spiritual warfare and to stand and to pray and to seek. And God is going through you and reaching out and pouring out over the body through those prayers that you're submitting to God. You may say, well, all I can do is pray. Well, that may be all you're supposed to do in that moment. Don't limit yourself, though, because of your personality giftings that, oh, that's my gift. I'm going to hide over here and just do this. Be willing. God often puts you in uncomfortable circumstances because he doesn't want us to be comfortable. He wants us to be obedient. And obedience, when you're comfortable, it kind of wanes down a little bit. All of a sudden, it's like, yeah, well, I'm a prayer warrior. I'm going to kick back in my prayer closet. <sighs> yeah, this is a good, comfortable place to be. Well, a true prayer warrior is not comfortable in that prayer closet because God has given them things to pray for that are not comfortable things. And often he reveals things through the word of knowledge. Another gift of the Spirit to, to, to impress upon them, to pray for things. And then there are the burden bearers. We all know burden bearers. I've known some so intense in their burden bearing that they, ha they, they had a hard time functioning sometimes because when they were around people that were hurting, they took on that pain themselves. And a burden bearer is a gift from God, but if it's not walked in balance, it can be torturous because we have to learn to submit that burden to the Lord. He's given it to you so your intensity of your prayers may be more full, that you're really in his presence more in depth. But at the same time, he's not putting it on you to, to bury you and to weigh you down. So you should never be weighed down as a burden bearer, but it's a gift. Walk in balance. Take that gifting and go forward in it. But sometimes he's going to call you to be that speaker. Sometimes he's going to call you to stand up in, in, in public, and sometimes it's going to be an uncomfortable thing. Whatever it is, 
Walk in obedience with it. But you're all important. It doesn't matter what God is doing through you as long as you're willing to let Him do it. Because it's all about Him anyway. And if one individual is not walking in the, in the Spirit, it affects the whole body. Now that doesn't mean that someone has a sinful behavior or a major sin in their life. It may just mean that, they're, that, that something is lacking because they're either holding back they're holding back between them and the Lord. No, I'm just not, I'm just, ah. Uh. And I'm going to whine a while before I actually engage. I don't want to do it. But he calls you to do it. And if you're holding back or not engaging in the gifting the way the Spirit is leading, it may not be a blatant sin, but think about it for a minute. If you're not walking in obedience... That sort of sin, isn't it? Oh, it isn't the big one. I ain't kill anybody today. No, but you haven't followed through today either. Now, I want to be clear this morning. God is going to accomplish His plan with or without you. But would you not rather be a part of what He's doing rather than just observing it and watching it go by? I've said this before, but it bears repeating. There are three types of people. The one who's part of what's happening. The one who watches what happened. And the one who wondered what happened. Which are we? Are we that one say, well, I didn't see that. What, what, what just happened? Well, God just moved in a mighty way. Where were you? Or, God, I, I really want this to happen. I really want this to happen. And, oh, wow, there it goes. Why aren't we... The ones who say, God, I want to be a part of what's happening. You want to see revival? Starts here. You want to see the movement of God? It starts here. Don't wait for the band to come along. Be the leader of the band. Be out front. Oh, but I'm not comfortable. Oh, here we are again, back in our comfort zone. It's not about that. It's about obedience. Don't hold back. Walk it out. After seeing the body as one with many individuals, but all called in unity with one another, Paul now breaks these gifts in a, in a sense of order. But at the same time, he makes it clear that not all of the gifts are given to all the people. There are gifts that are given, but not everybody gets the same gifts. And they may at some point experience many of the gifts, but not all at the same time. It's going to be, again, according to how the, how the Spirit wants to lead. But in verses 28 through 31, we read, And God has appointed these in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, administrations, Variety of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Do all have gifts of healings? Do not all speak, or do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But earnestly desire the best gifts, and yet I show you a more excellent way. So, reading this section here, it's very clear that he's asking rhetorical questions. He's saying, are all prophets? No. Are all apostles? No. Are all teachers? No. But he's appointed those. Now, if you took this and you say, okay, this is a sense of order. First, the apostles, then the prophets, then the teachers. Then after that, the miracles. Okay, now let's look at this in a balanced way. How many people have taken the movements of God and elevated them up above? This is the most important thing. How many people have taken the gift of tongues, the gift of, 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 of healing, and elevated it to be the most important thing? No, that's not the way it's supposed to be. It's given in order so that things work in order because God is a God of order. And to take any one of the gifts and push it to the top because that's the one you're drawn to, that's not a balanced approach, and it should never happen that way. And these verses repeat 
what we read in last week's study in 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 11. There are diversity of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministry, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it's the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healings by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. So we look at all these gifts. And again, I, I'm, not, I'm not putting this as an uh, 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 anchoring stone that each one of these has to go in this particular order. But if this is true, gifts of tongues and, and prophecy, they're kind of at the bottom of the list. Why then are they so elevated? Because we can use them with our nice big mouth. And we like to be heard. And many times, they're the ones that get us in trouble. When we get to chapter 14, I believe we're going to really see a lot more of that. But as we go through this, we have to come to the simple truth that it's not about us. It's really not about the gifts. It's all about loving God. It's all about a relationship to the Father through Jesus Christ. And it's all about submitting to the Spirit and walking in obedience to be used by Him, to be empowered by Him, to be used for His glory and for the edification of others. In other words, all about Him. Him first, then others, and we're at the back of the line. We should never, ever look at the gifts of the Spirit or any of the things of God and put ourselves in the mix and push it up to be what we're comfortable, what we like, what we think is important. It's not about any of those things. It's all about God doing the work through us. We need to learn. So in all of this, going back to the first part of this message, putting our past life behind. Doesn't matter where you come from. Doesn't matter what culture doesn't matter, again, your education. Doesn't matter about how wealthy you are. Doesn't matter about how poor you are. We're not victims in Jesus. We're victorious in Jesus. And the victim mentality goes out the window because that's the past. That's old. Was it true? Yes. There was oppression and is oppression in our culture today. I'm not saying it's not there. What I'm saying is, as a believer, you're no longer bound up in it on either side. You're not an oppressor, nor are you the oppressee. You're a child of God, and we need to walk that way. We put this behind us. That is the true call upon our lives. Of Philippians 3, 12 through 13, Paul said this, Not that I have already attained. Or am already perfected. But I press on. That I may lay hold of that which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended. But one thing I do. Keep, keep part of this passage this morning. Forgetting those things which are behind. And reaching forward to those things which are ahead. The things that are behind, we can't fix and we can't change. We cannot go back in time. There are a lot of movies and TV programs about time machines. Oh, we're going to go back and fix it. We're going to go back and change this. We're going to do it. It never comes out well. You know, back to the future. I mean, he had more problems you can shake a stick at. You know, going back and forth. Had to go back three, three, three different movies because couldn't get it right the first time. Still didn't get it right point i'm making here is that we can't go back there is no time machine but god who is not bound by time doesn't hold us in accountability 
for the past when we have received Jesus. The past is gone. It's over. And as far as our sin in Jesus, it's cast as far as the east is from the west. It's forgotten. We're now washed in the blood. We're white, no longer scarlet, red with stain, with sin. We're now white as snow. That's who we are in Christ. Now, you may say, I don't feel that way. Well, we can't go by our feelings because they'll lie to you. Your emotions will lie to you every single moment of every single day. I feel this. I feel that. And that's the key phrase today. I feel. You know, I feel like a woman when you're a man. I feel like a man when I'm a woman. I'm sorry. You can feel what you feel. And those feelings are real. But they are deceptions. And they are lying to you. Because you are what you are. And Jesus tells you you are now changed. You want to be somebody different? Walk away from the world and come to Jesus. You'll be changed. But you'll be right. And you'll have a clear sense of who you are. Your identity is no longer male or female and all this other garbage that's out there. It is Jesus. That's your identity. You're one with Him. And Paul concludes this portion of the letter by saying that we should desire the best gifts. And what are the best gifts? Again, if we want to categorize it, you'll have some, Oh, tongues is it! Woo-hoo-hoo! Prophecy! I'm going to tell you what God has to say. Or boom, you're healed. Listen. You know what the best gifts are? The best gifts, simply put, are the ones the Spirit wants you to have. Desire those. Desire those. Desire them all, but be content with His giving them as He wills so we don't find ourselves feeling like we're lacking or that I'm not enough. And that's a big song out there, you know. Uh, one of the key worship women out there, I'm, I'm not this, I'm not that, but you tell me that, yeah. Listen, too much time in that song focused on me. I'm sorry. It's all about Jesus. It should be all about Him. Worship songs are worshiping Him, not putting ourselves and saying, oh, you told me I'm this and you told me I'm that. He's already told you all you need to know when He said, you're my child. Go with that. And put all this other feeling stuff behind you. It doesn't work. And it will never work. But walking in the Spirit. We don't need to be feeling that we're lacking. But we need to be excited and filled with expectation. Of what He's going to do. What's He doing next? Wow, what's God going to do next? And is He going to use me? Am I willing? That's what we need to know. And in verse 31, he ends this way, but earnestly desire the best gift, and yet I show you a more excellent way. That's next week's message. I could go into it now, but I know y'all going to want to eat lunch at some point. And our next message is the more excellent way. Feel free to read ahead, by the way. This is, this is what's often called as the love chapter. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It's not a real long uh, read go forth and read it pray over it and we come together next week and we're going to hear what the most excellent way is it's going to be a good one but you know what when we're submitted to the Lord and studying his word they're all good ones why because it leaves us uplifted yeah there's a lot of sin in the world there's a lot of pain in the world there's a lot of suffering in the world and unfortunately, many of, many of those things have crept in the front door of the church and it's brought dissension and we have division. But there's hope. And our hope is Jesus Christ. And He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And He has sent the Holy Spirit to dwell in each one of us. How can we say we don't have any hope? Well, well have you heard the news lately? Nah, nah, I really don't turn it on. I do. I keep up with what's going on. But you know what I'm saying. I'm not going to turn on a news channel and stay in front of that and say, Oh, my God, we're all going to die. Well, yeah, we are. You're born. When you take your first breath, you begin to die. Why? Because sin entered the world. And when sin came, death came. It's a natural process. Yeah, but I don't want it to happen today. Like Red Skelton used to say, you know, I'm not afraid to die. I just don't want to be there when it happens. 
But listen, we don't have to be in fear of any of this stuff. We are serving a living God who is sitting on the throne right now and he's leading everything up to Jesus' return. Are you ready for that? That's what we need to be desiring. That's our expectation. But until that happens, what is our hope? It's today. We've got today. What are you going to do with it today? Are you going to walk with him today? Or are you going to just push him aside and live the way you want and act like it's all okay and walk in your own deal, not in the, not in the spirit, not in unity? He's calling for a unified body. He's coming for a church that's spotless, without wrinkle, without blemish. Well, we're not there, are we? No. But he's coming for those who put him first in their lives. That's who the church is. And those are the ones that, that need to be prepared. Out of the ten virgins, only five were prepared. The other five, well, we're just going to go and see what happens. Oh, wait a minute. Now we don't have any oil. Give us some of your oil. No, sorry. <laughs> we prepared. You go get your own oil. Then the bridegroom came. And they were left out. Because they weren't prepared. The church needs to be prepared. We need to be prepared. But we can't prepare by the news and we can't prepare by putting headlines into Scripture and saying, oh, this means this. Oh, this, is, this fulfills this prophecy. Listen, there are some prophecies that are yet to be fulfilled. And I believe if you're walking with Jesus, if we're still here when some of these things take place, we're going to know it. When that temple is rebuilt in Jerusalem, we're going to know it. Now, you might say, well, Jesus might take us before it's built. He might because that's right at that cusp. But then we know everything we need to know at that point. So what are we worried about it now for? Let's walk it out by faith in the relationship that we've get, been given. Then walk out by faith the gifts that the Holy Spirit wants to give us. And walk out by faith being obedient to receive what he has. And to live your life in accordance to his plan. That is what he wants us to do today. We don't have tomorrow. Yet. Maybe not at all. And we don't have yesterday. It's gone. But you got right now. What are you going to do with it right now? It's all you're accountable for. So Lord, we come to you this morning. And we ask that you just awaken our hearts unto your spirit's movement within our lives. For those who are believers this morning, Lord, there's a challenge put before us. And that challenge is what the word tells us, to die to ourselves and to walk in the spirit. That challenge today is to not elevate myself and put myself in a place of, 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 um, of being prominent or important. We're to die to that. We're to put all of that stuff aside. We're new creations. We're children of God. Let us walk like it and let us talk like it and let us be what you've called us to be. In the name of Jesus, we submit ourselves to you this morning. Lord, may you have your way in each one of us, and may you accomplish through us what you want to accomplish. We love you, and we praise you, we thank you, and we submit to you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. We have heard God's word, we have praised him in song, we have shared sweet fellowship a few moments long as we leave this place in Jesus' tender care. We will share his love with people everywhere. May God keep us till we gather here.